Hello, hello everyone, Ryan from Avatar Aquatics. Welcome to part two of my video series in breeding the beautiful Cardinal Tetra. To summarize in part one, we talked about how to set up the breeding tank, how to choose your breeders, and also how to condition them to get them into that perfect mood to start spawning. And in part two, we are going from egg to wiggler into three weeks of their development. I promise you part one is worth watching right up here in the top right corner. This video will make so much more sense if you have seen my prior videos. But let's get started and dive right into it. The first time I found Fry was magical. I had been a couple days in the spawning tank and there I was in the morning seeing all the white opaque eggs they had dropped scattered overnight along the bottom of the peat moss and although the white eggs are infertile I knew there would be plenty of healthy developing eggs hidden among the moss so I removed the adults to stop them from eating the eggs and waited until the sun set. That night armed with only a flashlight I saw dozens of fry and to see these little babies zoom in and out of the peat moss in the dead of night after so much research, experimentation, and hard work was such a rewarding experience and I'm super excited to share this story with you. Three hours after the eggs are laid, the eggs are almost completely clear with just a hint of yellow yolk and already the embryos are starting to develop muscles and vertebrae. The big oval shape is actually a spherical yolk and as they grow the yolk gradually gets smaller and the fish itself will become bigger and more developed. After a mere 16 to 20 hours, so less than a day, the eggs hatch out and become tiny little fry. They're still very underdeveloped compared to other fish fry and do not take any food. This is one hour after hatching. They remain motionless at the bottom of the tank and really don't do much other than just sit there. And in this video, the dark spot by the eyes is actually a dust particle and the eye is completely colorless at this stage, not black. However, they will react to light and water movement and they try to swim away even at this very early stage. At one full day after hatching, the fry can do a very fast buzzing motion all throughout their bodies as they react to the bright light of the microscope LED or your flashlight and exercise their newly formed muscle. They continue this stage until the end of day three, shown here. Now, the yolk has almost completely disappeared, the fry has developed their eyes and are much more fish-like. And it's easy to see the two dark eyes, the internal organs, the heart, the GI tract, and also the cells that will later divide and cover the fish, giving them their classic neon blue and red colors. Now, I don't know why their bodies are green inside, but if I had to guess, I would say maybe bile or some other intestinal fluids as they get ready to start hunting for microorganisms. On day four, they have completely finished their yolk sac. From prior experience with other fry like the German Blue Ram and Bettas, I know that fry at this stage will start to explore and hunt. But to be completely honest, I have never seen them hunt or eat on day four. I knew that they could be eating the organisms hidden from the peat moss, so I conducted a experiment where I kept day four fry isolated in a clean container without food or feeding and the result was that they started to die on day five. And so this leads me to believe that feeding on day four is crucial to their survival. My observation is that they spend an entire day hiding in the mosque and become much more active at night. So I start feeding infusoria at the start of day four. If I don't, they start dying on day five. Now the fry at this stage are too small to eat baby brine shrimp and microworms, regardless of what you hear on the internet. In order to provide live microfoods to the babies, I have to make infusoria in advance before I start spawning the cardinal tetras. Do not be caught without small enough food for your cardinal babies. So I just, I just toss fish food, aquarium water, and java moss from one of my tanks into a cup. It's placed on the windowsill for nine to 12 days and at that point it's ready to feed. I have a really helpful video detailing my steps linked in the upper right corner now, as well as down in the description below. But an extra tip is to cover the culture because it does smell super bad after a couple of days. I use a blunt needle and syringe to feed the fry so that I can pick out only paramecium and avoid as much bacteria as possible. 
At day four, the fry cannot swim very well, and of the few glimpses that I do catch, they often lie on their sides. The fry cannot catch faster foods like copepods, and my recommendation is to start them on slower prey like paramecium. I feed twice a day, once in the morning, and a larger feeding at night to match their nocturnal schedule. After two weeks and judging that they've put on some size, I slowly start adding freshly hatched live baby brine shrimp to the tank. To keep the water soft and devoid of minerals, I always wash the salt water off with tap water. They only eat very small amounts of food at this point, so a tiny bit is enough. The less the better, but in case you overfeed a little bit, the uneaten ones will fall to the bottom, providing ample hunting over the next few hours. I usually do this in the evening as the sunlight starts to dim. Now they are still nocturnal and you will still have a hard time finding them during the day, so I like to wait until around 11 p.m. to go and shine a flashlight around the tank and I'll usually see some fry with very filled bellies. A tip is to look around moss and other hiding spots as these fry are super shy unlike other species like the German Blue Ram and during this time I will still feed Infusoria and around the third week in the fourth week when I'm certain that the fry have grown big enough for baby rind shrimp, that's when I stop the infusoria. At this point, I want to remind you of two big takeaway lessons that I stressed in part one. Feeding schedules should follow the feed a lot of times, but not a lot each time mantra. And the decision to switch from infusoria to larger foods should always be done after careful observation of your own fry, not through the recommendation timeline of someone on YouTube. Your fish will tell you when they are ready to eat larger foods, and these guidelines I've given are only a broad suggestion of what worked for me. Fish development largely depends on the temperature, the water parameters, as well as the competition among the fry. So I keep my fish in the same water parameters as the spawning tank, but at 27 degrees Celsius, just a bit cooler than the spawning tank, which is set at 29 degrees Celsius. This is a good segue into talking about the fry rare out or grow out container. Now you're really only going to need this if you aren't doing the peat moss method and you opted to go for the breeding mesh material because you're going to have to isolate the eggs every time they spawned and put them into a rare out tank so the adults do not get to the fry. Now this is a super simple setup, three gallon Aquion cube rimless tank filled with the exact same water parameters as the spawning tank, super soft water and acidic. I also add a lot of java moss in there as well as a sponge filter and a heater to keep the temperature at 27 degrees Celsius and these guys will remain in here until they are large enough in juveniles. If you search up any article on breeding cardinal tetras online, you will notice that they all mention that fry and eggs are quote unquote photosensitive and cannot tolerate light. Some sites even go so far as to mention that allowing light to shine on your cardinal tetra eggs will cause them to die. And as a biologist, I couldn't find any research articles detailing what I see to be a highly crippling trait, an evolutionary trait. You can imagine that in the backwaters of the Amazon where these guys naturally spawn, there must be some time when wind or water flow will expose these eggs to sunlight and if the fry or eggs die after exposure to light, they would be at a very, very big competitive disadvantage. Plus, at what time during their development would it be right to lose their photosensitivity and become normal fish? Something smelled fishy here, so I decided to do another experiment. I collected eggs that were freshly laid, put them into a cup, and hatched them six inches under this bright LED Phoenix Stingray 2 planted aquarium light. I set the timer for eight hours each day at the same temperature, 29 degrees Celsius, and monitored their development. And what I found was that the photosensitive claim was not super relevant for me. And of the 15 eggs that I had isolated for this experimental procedure, 15, so all of them, survived to day four at normal developmental schedules, at which time they were transferred back to my grow out tank along with 15 of the control group that were kept in the dark. There were no casualties so don't be afraid to shine a flashlight on your fry to check their developmental progress. 
In the end, the greatest barrier to egg survival was fungal attack with an overwhelming 100% death rate if the hatching container was not medicated with methylene blue. I add one drop of 1% methylene blue solution per 100 milliliters of water during the first day when there are still eggs, and once the fry hatch that same night, I do not add any more methylene blue. As for the fry, not feeding them on day four and not keeping them warm enough are the two main reasons why some of my attempts ended in total failure. This project took me almost a year to complete, as well as trying out different vendors for my breeders themselves. Sometimes I just lost entire schools of fish after taking them home from the store. And it was definitely a rocky road, so if you fail at your first try, don't be afraid to reach out to me in the comments below or on Instagram at Avatar Aquatics and keep trying. So thank you so much for your support. Don't forget to like this video so we can reach as many people as possible and subscribe if you'd like to see part three of my Cardinal Tetra breeding series where I cover the later weeks of their development. Ryan, out, and we'll see you next time.